There was once upon a time a king who was very rich in lands and money. When his wife died he was inconsolable, and for eight whole days he shut himself up in a little room, and knocked his head against the wall, so desperate was he. They feared lest he should kill himself, and they therefore put mattresses between the tapestry and the wall, so that however hard he might strike his head, he could do himself no harm. All his subjects planned amongst themselves to go and see him, and to say everything they could think of as likely to comfort him in his sorrow. Some of them made up grave and serious speeches, others again went with cheerful, even gay words on their tongues, but none of them made any impression on him. In fact he hardly heard what they said. At last there came before him a woman clad all in black crepe, with veil and mantle and long mourning garments, who wept and sobbed so loud and so violently that he was filled with astonishment. She said that, unlike the others, she had come with the object of adding to, rather than of lessening, his grief, for what could be more natural than to sorrow for a good wife. As for her, she had had the best husband in the whole world, and it was her part now to weep for him while she had eyes in her head. Thereupon she redoubled her cries, and the king following her example, began to wail aloud. He gave her a better reception than he had done to the others, entertaining her with an account of the fine qualities of his dear dead lady, while she waxed eloquent on those of her beloved husband. They talked and talked till they had not a word more to say on the subject of their sorrows. When the cunning widow saw that there was nothing more to be said on the matter, she lifted her veil just a little, and it was some relief to the king in the midst of his distress to look on this poor lady afflicted like himself. Her large blue eyes, fringed with long black eyelashes, she rolled this way and that way, to make the most of their beauty, and then her cheeks were rosy too. The king looked at her very attentively. Gradually he spoke less of his wife, then he stopped speaking of her altogether. The widow still declared she would always lament her husband, but the king begged her not to sorrow for ever. In the end, to everybody's astonishment, he married her, and her mourning garments were changed to gowns of green and rose color. It often happens that you have but to know people's weak points to win their hearts and do with them what you will. The king had only one daughter by his first marriage, and she was looked on as the eighth wonder of the world. They called her Florine, because she was like Flora, so fresh and young and beautiful was she. She did not care to be dressed very grandly, but liked rather robes of floating taffeta, with jeweled clasps, and garlands of flowers to adorn her lovely hair. When the king married again she was only fifteen years old. The new queen sent for her own daughter, who had been brought up in the house of her godmother, Susio the fairy, though she was none the more graceful or beautiful for that. Susio had done what she could for her, but without success. Yet she loved her dearly none the less. They called the girl Triton, for her face had as many red spots as a trout. Her black hair was so dirty and greasy that you could not touch it, and oil oozed out from her yellow skin. All the same the queen loved her to distraction, and would speak of nothing but of Triton's charms. But as Florine was far more attractive, the queen was in despair. In all kinds of ways she tried to raise quarrels between her and the king, and not a day passed but she and Triton did Florine some bad turn. The princess was, however, good-tempered and intelligent, and endeavored to take no notice of their bad behavior. One day the king said to the queen that Florine and Triton were old enough to be married, and that the hand of one of them must be bestowed on the first prince who should come to the court. I think, said the queen, that my daughter should be thought of first of all, seeing that she is older than yours, and as she is far more amiable there can be no hesitation in agreeing to this. The king did not like disputing, so he said he was quite willing, and the queen might do as she liked. Some little time after they heard that King Charming was going to pay them a visit. 
Never was there so splendid and so gallant a prince, and everything in his mind and person answered to his name. When the queen heard of his coming she employed all the embroiderers, and all the dressmakers, and all the craftsmen, to make things for Triton. She begged the king to give Florine nothing new, and, by bribing her maids, she had all her dresses, and wreaths, and jewels taken away the very day that Charming arrived, so that when the princess wished to deck herself she could not find so much as a ribbon. Florine was well aware to whom she owed this bad turn. When she sent to buy stuffs the merchants told her the queen had forbidden them to sell her any. So she had nothing to put on but a dirty little frock, and so much ashamed of it was she that she sat down in a corner of the hall when King Charming came in. The queen received him with much ceremony, and presented her daughter to him, clad in the most splendid apparel, and uglier than usual in her grandeur. When the king turned away his eyes the queen would have liked to persuade herself that it was because Triton dazzled him too much, and that he feared the effect of her charms on him, so she always pushed her forward. He asked if there was not another princess called Florine. Yes, said Triton, pointing to her. She is hiding over there, because she is not very nicely dressed. Florine blushed, and looked at that moment so beautiful, so very, very beautiful, that King Charming was quite dazzled. Rising quickly, he made a deep bow to the princess, saying, Madam, your incomparable beauty already adorns you too well for you to need any other aid. Your Majesty, she answered, I must tell you I am little accustomed to wearing so poor a dress as this, and I should have liked better had you taken no notice of me. It would have been impossible, cried Charming, that so lovely a princess should have been anywhere near me and that I should have had eyes for anyone else. Ah, said the queen, who was much annoyed. What a waste of time is this. Believe me, sire, Florine is vain enough already. She doesn't need so many compliments paid to her. King Charming understood at once the motives that made the queen speak in this way, but as he was not in a humor to restrain his feelings he let all his admiration for Florine be seen, and talked to her for three hours on end. The queen was in despair, and Triton was inconsolable at not being preferred to the princess. They complained loudly to the king, and forced him to consent during King Charming's stay to shut Florine up in a tower, where they would not see each other. So as soon as she had gone back to her room four men with masks carried her off to the top of the tower, and left her there in the utmost distress. She knew quite well she was only treated thus to prevent her from pleasing King Charming, whom she already liked very much and whom she would willing have accepted as a husband. As Charming was ignorant of the wrong they had done to the princess, he was waiting the hour when he would see her again with the greatest impatience. He spoke of her to those whom the king had ordered to be in attendance on him, but by the queen's command they told him all the harm they could of her, that she was vain, and of an uncertain and violent temper, that she was a plague to her friends and her servants, that she was slovenly, and so avaricious that she preferred to be dressed like a little shepherdess rather than to buy rich stuffs with the money the king, her father, gave her. Charming writhed to hear all this, and he had much ado to restrain the anger that stirred within him. No, he said to himself. It is not possible that heaven should have made so evil a soul to dwell in nature's masterpiece. I own she was not suitably dressed when I saw her, but her evident shame shows she is not used to being in that condition, what? So they tell me she could be wicked with that charming look of modesty and gentleness. Such a thing could not possibly be it is easier for me to believe that the queen slanders her. She is not a stepmother for nothing, and Princess Triton is such an ugly creature that it would not be strange if she were jealous of the most perfect being in the world. While he was thinking over all this, the courtiers who were with him saw quite well from his manner that he was not pleased at their speaking evil of Florine. There was one amongst them sharper than the others, and he, 
changing his tone and language in order to find out what the prince really felt, began to pay compliments to the princess. At this Charming woke up as from a profound sleep, and took part in the conversation, his face showing perfectly the joy he felt. Love, how difficult it is to hide thee! Thou art everywhere visible, on a lover's lips, in his eyes, in the sound of his voice. When we love, the signs of it appear in our every action, in our silence, our conversation, in our joy, in our sorrow. The queen, impatient to know if King Charming was really impressed, sent for those she had taken into her confidence, and she spent the rest of the night in questioning them. All they told her only served to confirm the opinion that the king was in love with Florine. But what shall I say of the melancholy condition of that poor princess, as she lay on the floor of the dungeon in that terrible tower into which the masked men had brought her? It would be easier to bear, she said, if they had put me here before I had seen that king, who is so amiable. The recollection of him only makes my distress harder to bear, and I have no doubt that it is to hinder me from seeing him any more that the queen treats me so cruelly. Alas! Whatever beauty heaven may have endowed me with will have to be paid for by my happiness. Then she cried, and cried so bitterly, that her worst enemy would have been sorry for her had she seen her misery. So the night passed. The queen, who wished to attach King Charming to her by all the marks of attention possible, sent him costumes of a richness and magnificence nowhere else to be found, fashioned after the mode of the country and also the order of the Knights of Love, which she had made the king institute on their wedding day. It was a golden heart enameled in fire color. There were several arrows round it, and one that pierced it through, and the words, One alone wounds me. The queen had had the heart for Charming's order cut out of a ruby as big as an ostrich's egg. Each arrow was made of a single diamond as long as your finger and the chain from which it hung was made of pearls, the smallest of which weighed a pound. In short, since the beginning of the world, a like thing had never been seen. At sight of it the king was so astounded that for some minutes he could not speak. At the same time he was presented with a book, the leaves of which were of vellum, with wonderful miniatures. The cover was of gold, studded with precious stones, and it contained the statutes of the Order of the Knights of Love, written in very tender and very gallant style. They told the king that the princess whom he had seen begged him to be her knight, and that she sent him this present. On hearing this he flattered himself it might be from her whom he loved. What? The fair princess Florine, cried he. She remembers me in so charming and so generous a fashion. Your Majesty, they said. You make a mistake in the name. It is from the lovely Truton we come. Then it is Truton who begs me to be her knight, said the king, in a cold and serious manner. I am sorry not to be able to accept this honor, but a sovereign is not sufficiently his own master to do everything he would like. I know the duties of a knight, and I would like to fulfill them all but I prefer rather to decline the favors she offers me than to prove myself unworthy of them. So saying, he put back the heart, the chain, and the book in the same basket, and returned all of them to the queen, who, as well as her daughter, was nearly mad with rage at the scornful way in which the stranger king had received so special a favor. As soon as he found opportunity he went to the apartment of the king and queen, hoping Florine would be there, and looking about everywhere to see her. Whenever anyone came into the room he turned his head abruptly towards the door, and seemed anxious and disappointed. The wicked queen knew well enough what was passing in his mind, but she did not let him see that she did, and spoke of nothing but pleasure parties, receiving from him quite foolish answers in return. At last he asked where the princess Florine was. Your Majesty, said the Queen, hotly. The King, her father, has forbidden her to leave her own apartments till my daughter be married. 
And what reason can there be for keeping this fair lady a prisoner? I do not know, said the queen. And even if I did I might be excused from telling you. The king was in a fury of passion, and cast black looks at Triton as he thought to himself it was on account of that little monster that they robbed him of the pleasure of seeing the princess. Then he left the queen abruptly, for her presence was more than he could bear. When he was again in his own room he told a young prince who had come with him, and whom he loved dearly, to give any bribe in the world to one of the attendants of the princess, so that he might speak with her a moment. The prince had no difficulty in finding some ladies-in-waiting who were willing to be taken into his confidence, and one of them assured him that every evening Florine would be at a little window overlooking the garden, where she could speak to him, provided he took great precautions to prevent its being known. For, she added, the king and the queen are so severe that they would kill me if they discovered that I had favored charming suit. The prince, delighted at having thus far succeeded, promised all she wished, and ran to pay his respects to the king, and to tell him the hour appointed. But the faithless waiting woman did not fail to go and warn the queen of what was going on, and to take her orders accordingly. The queen at once made up her mind to send her daughter to the little window. She gave her instructions what to do, and Triton remembered them every one, though she was naturally very stupid. The night was so dark that it would have been impossible for the king to see the trick that was being played him, even if he had been less confident than he was. So he drew near to the window with such transports of joy as cannot be described, and said to Triton all he would have said to Florine, to persuade her to believe what love he felt for her. Triton, making the best of the opportunity, told him she was the most unhappy girl in the world to have so cruel a stepmother, and that she would always have to suffer till her stepsister should get married. The king assured her that if she would have him for a husband he would be delighted to share with her his crown and his heart. So saying, he drew the ring from his finger, and putting it on Triton's, he told her it was for an everlasting token of his faith, and that she had only to fix the time and they would set off without delay. Triton gave what answer she could to all his passionate speeches, but he noticed that there was very little in what she said. This would have grieved him had he not persuaded himself that the fear of being surprised by the queen was a check on her spirits. He only left her on condition that he might come back next night at the same hour, to which she consented with the utmost willingness. The queen was in great hopes after hearing of the success of this interview. Now the day of their escape being fixed, the king came to take the princess away in a flying chaise, drawn by winged frogs, which one of his friends, a wizard, had made him a present of. The night was very dark. Triton crept out of a little door with great mystery, and the king, who was waiting for her, received her in his arms and swore eternal faithfulness to her. But as he had no desire to go flying through the air in this chaise for ever so long without marrying the princess whom he loved, he asked her when she would like their wedding to take place. She told him that she had for godmother a very celebrated fairy called Susio, and that she wished to go and visit her at her castle. Although the king did not know the way, he had nothing to do but tell his big frogs to take them there, for they knew the chart of the whole world, and in no time they landed the king and Triton at Susio's dwelling. The castle was so brilliantly lighted that there the king would have found out his mistake had not the princess carefully covered herself with her veil. Having asked to see her godmother she spoke to her in private, telling her how she had entrapped Charming, and begging Susio to make her peace with him. But, my daughter, said the fairy, that is no easy thing. He is much too fond of Florine for that, and I feel certain he will disappoint us. Meanwhile the king awaited them in a hail, whose walls were of diamonds, so clear and transparent that through them he saw Susio and Triton talking together. He thought he must be dreaming. What, he said, have I been tricked? Have the demons brought hither that enemy of our happiness? Has she come to interfere with my marriage? 
My dear Florine is not to be seen. Perhaps her father has followed her. All kinds of things suggested themselves to his mind, and he began to be in despair. But it was much worse when they came into the room, and when Susio said, in a commanding tone, King Charming, here is Princess Triton, to whom you have pledged your word. She is my god and I command that you marry her at once. What, I, cried the king. I marry this little monster, you must think me of a very docile disposition since you make such a proposal to me. In truth, I have promised her nothing, and if she says anything to the contrary she. Stop, interrupted Susio, and never be so bold as to fail in respect for me. I am quite willing, answered the king, to give you all the respect that is due to a fairy, provided that you give me back my princess. And am I not your princess, faithless wretch, said Triton, showing him the ring. To whom did you give this ring as a token of fidelity? To whom did you speak at the little window, if not to me? What, he cried, I have been tricked and deceived. But, no, I shall not be your dupe. Quick there. My frogs, my frogs. I shall depart at once. Ho, oh, said Susio. That is not in your power unless I give leave. And so saying she touched him, and his feet stuck fast to the floor as if they had been nailed to it. Though you were to stone me, or to flog me, said the king, I shall never own another mistress but Florine. On this I am determined, and, knowing that, you can use your power as you like. Susio tried every means to soften his resolve, gentleness, threats, promises, supplications. Triton wept, cried aloud, groaned, flew into tempers, and cooled down again. The king said not a word, and looking at them both with the most scornful air in the world, paid not the faintest attention to all they said to him. Twenty days and twenty nights passed away in this fashion, during which they never stopped talking, never ate, never slept, never sat down. At last Susio, tired out, could endure it no longer, and said to the king, Well, you are indeed stubborn. Why will you not listen to reason? Take your choice, you shall have seven years' penance for having made a promise you have not kept, or you shall marry my God. The king, who had never uttered a word till now, cried out suddenly, Do whatever you like with me, only deliver me from this detestable creature. I am no more detestable than you, said Triton, wrathfully. You silly little king, coming with your equipage, fit only for the bogs, to my country, to insult and to break faith with me. If you had a particle of honor, would you behave so? These reproaches touch me deeply, said the king, in mocking tone. How foolish not to take so fair a lady for my wife! No, no, said Susio, angrily. She will never marry you. You have only to fly out of the window if you want to. For seven years you will be changed into a blue bird. At that moment the king's person changed. His arms were covered with feathers, and turned into wings. His legs and feet became black and shrunken, with hooked claws. His body dwindled in size, and was all covered with long fine feathers, some of them of sky blue, his eyes became round, and shone like two planets his nose was nothing but an ivory beak, and on his head stood up a white plume in the shape of a crown. He could sing exquisitely and speak too. He uttered a cry of pain to see himself metamorphosed, and flew as fast as ever he could to escape from Susio's horrible palace. In the melancholy state into which he had fallen he hopped about from branch to branch, choosing only those trees consecrated to love and sorrow now on a myrtle, now on a cypress, singing sad songs, in which he lamented the evil fortune that pursued Florine anti himself. Where have her enemies hidden her, said he? What has become of that fair victim? Does the cruelty of the queen still deprive her of her liberty? 
where can I seek for her? Am I doomed to spend seven years without her? Perhaps during that time they will give her in marriage, and I shall lose forever the hope that sustains my life. All these thoughts so filled Blue Bird with despair that he wished to die. To return to Triton, the fairy Susio sent her back to the queen, who was most anxious to hear how the wedding had passed off. But when she saw her daughter, and heard from her all that had happened, she flew into a terrible passion, of which the full force fell on poor Florine. She shall duly repent, said the queen, of having found favor in charming sighs. She went up the tower with Triton, whom she had dressed in her grandest clothes. On her head was a diamond crown, and three daughters of the richest barons in the kingdom held the train of her royal mantle. On her thumb was Charming's ring that Florine had noticed the day they had talked together. She was very much surprised to see Triton in such gorgeous apparel. Here comes my daughter, who brings you presents in honor of her wedding, said the queen. King Charming has married her, he loves her to distraction, and there never were two happier people. Then they spread out before the princess gold and silver stuffs, jewels, laces, ribbons, in great baskets of gold filigree work. In presenting all these things Triton never forgot for a moment to make the king's ring flash, and Princess Florine, no longer able to hide from herself her misfortune, begged them with cries of despair to take all these miserable presents out of her sight, that she would never again wear anything hut black, or rather that she would like now to die. Then she fainted, and the cruel queen, delighted at her success, would not allow anyone to come to Florine's aid. She left her alone in the most deplorable condition, and went and told the king maliciously that his daughter was so excited by her love that nothing could equal the absurd things she did, and that on no account must they allow her to get out of the tower. The king said she might manage the matter as she liked, and he would be satisfied whatever she did. When the princess recovered from her fainting fit, and began to reflect on the way she was treated, the cruelty of her wicked stepmother towards her, and the hope she was losing forever of marrying King Charming, her grief became so keen that she cried all night, and in this condition she sat herself down at the window where she uttered sad and plaintive laments. When day was near she shut the window and wept anew. The following night she opened the window and sat heaving deep sighs, sobbing bitterly, and shedding torrents of tears. When day came she retired into her room. But King Charming, or rather the beautiful blue bird, flew round and round the palace, thinking his dear princess was inside, and if her laments were sad, his were no less so. He came as near to the windows as he could to peer into the room, but the fear lest Triton should see him, and discover who he was, kept him from doing all he wished. It would cost me my life, said he to himself. If those wicked princesses find out where I am they will seek to revenge themselves. I must go away if I do not wish to run into the utmost danger. These considerations made him take great precautions, and as a rule he sang only at night time. In front of Florine's window was a cypress of a tremendous height, and there the blue bird came and perched. Hardly was he there before he heard the cries of a lady. How long will my sufferings last, she said. Will death not come to my aid? To those who fear him he comes but too soon, but for me, who long for him, he tarries cruelly. Ah, cruel queen! What harm have done you that you should keep me shut up in this horrible prison? Are there not other ways enough in which to torture me? You need only let me look on at the happiness which your wicked daughter enjoys with King Charming. The blue bird had lost not a word of this lament, which filled him with astonishment, and he waited for daylight with the utmost impatience to see the sorrowful lady. But before the dawn she had shut her window and gone out of sight. The bird, full of curiosity, did not fail to return next night. By the light of the moon that was then in the sky he saw a damsel at the window of the tower, 
and heard her beginning her lament. Fortune, she said dash, that flatters me by setting me in a place of power, that made me the darling of my father, what have I done that thou shouldst all at once plunge me into the bitterest waters, should I begin to feel thy changefulness in these my tender years? Return, cruel one, return, if possible, and all I ask of thee is to end my unhappy life. The blue bird listened, and the longer he listened the more persuaded was he that it was his dear princess who was uttering these laments. Adorable Florine, he said, the wonder of our days, why do you long that yours should be so soon ended? Your misfortunes are not without a remedy. Ah! Who is it speaks to me with words of comfort, she cried. An unhappy king, replied the bird. He loves you, and will never love anyone else. A king who loves me, she said. Is this some snare my enemy has laid for me? But in the end what would she gain by it? If she seeks to find out what my feelings are, I am ready to make them all known to her. No, my princess he answered. The lover who now speaks to you is not capable of betraying you. And so saying he flew on to the window sill. At first Florine was very much afraid of a bird so strange, that spoke as sensibly as a man, though in the gentle notes of a nightingale, but the beauty of its plumage and the words it said reassured her. Do I in truth see you again, my princess, he cried. Can I taste such perfect happiness and not die for joy? But, alas! How my joy is troubled by your captivity, and at the shape into which Susio has changed me for seven years. And who are you, you charming bird, said the princess, caressing him. You call me by my name, said the king, and you pretend not to know me. What, said the princess. The little bird in my hand is king, charming. Alas! Fair Florine. It is but too true, he replied. And if anything could console me it is that I have preferred to suffer this rather than give up my love for you. For me, said Florine. Ah! Do not seek to deceive me. I know, I know that you have married Truton. I recognize the ring on her finger as yours. I saw her sparkling with the diamonds you had given her. She came to insult me in my sad captivity, wearing a grand crown and royal mantle that she got from you, and all the while I was laden with chains and irons. You saw Truton in such a dress, interrupted the king. Her mother and herself have dared to say that these baubles came from me. Heaven! Is it possible I hear such horrible lies, and that I cannot take my revenge on the spot? Believe me, they tried to deceive me, and by using your name they managed to make me run away with the hideous Truton, but as soon as I discovered my mistake I left her, choosing rather to be blue bird for seven long years than break my troth to you. Florine was in such delight to hear these words from her dear lover that she forgot altogether her sufferings in the prison. What did she not say to him to comfort him for his sad mischance? and to persuade him that she would do no less for him than he had done for her. The day appeared, and the greater number of the officers of the court were already stirring while Blue Bird and the princess were still speaking together. It was terrible to tear themselves apart, and they only did so after promising to see each other in this way every night. The joy they felt at having found each other again was so great that there are no words to describe it. Each of them in turn gave thanks to love and fortune, yet Florine was sad on Blue Bird's account. Who will protect him from the fowlers, she said. Or from the sharp claw of some eagle or famished vulture. Who will devour him none the less greedily that he is a great king. Oh heaven! What would become of me if his light and delicate feathers, driven by the wind, were to come to my prison and to announce the danger that I fear. For this thought the princess could not close an eye, for when one is in love illusions appear real, 
and what at another time would be thought impossible seems easy then, so that she spent her day in weeping till the hour came to seat herself at the window. The lovely bird, hidden in the hollow of a tree, had been all day long thinking of his dear princess. How happy I am, he said, to have found her again. Anti how charming she is! And how grateful I am for all her kindness to me! This tender lover counted every moment of the time of trial during which he could not marry her, and never was the end of anything longed for more passionately. As he wished to pay Florine every attention within his power, he flew to the capital of his kingdom, entered his own room by a broken pane of glass, chose out diamond earrings so perfect and so beautiful that nothing in the world could be compared to them. That evening he took them to Florine, and begged her to put them on. I would do so willingly, she said, if you saw me during the day but since I never speak to you but in the night I shall not put them on. The bird promised to choose his time so well that he would come to the tower at any hour she liked. Then she put on the earrings, and the night, like the last, was spent in talking. The next day Blue Bird returned to his kingdom, went to his palace, entered his own room by the broken pane, and carried off the richest bracelets that were ever seen. They were made of a single emerald, cut in facets, with a hole bored through the middle through which to pass the hand and wrist. Do you think that my love for you needs to be fed by gifts? Ah, how little you know of it! No, madam, he answered, I do not think that the trifles I offer you are needed to safeguard your tenderness for me, but mine would suffer hurt if I neglected any opportunity of showing my attention, and when I am away from you these little trinkets will remind you of me. Florine answered him with many loving words, to which he replied by others none the less so. The following night the bird, eager to show his love, did not fail to bring to his fair lady a watch of just the right size. It was encased in a pearl, and the excellence of the workmanship excelled even the material it was made of. What is the use of a watch to me? she said, by way of a compliment. When you are away from me the hours seem never-ending. When you are with me they pass like a dream. And thus I can never measure them exactly. Alas! My princess, cried Blue Bird, I feel just as you do, indeed I believe I feel this even more keenly than yourself. After what you suffer by reason of your faithfulness to me, she answered. I am ready to believe that greater respect and love than you bear me would be impossible. As soon as daylight appeared the bird flew into the hollow of his tree, where he lived on fruits. Sometimes he would sing beautiful airs, delighting the passers-by, who hearing him and seeing no one, came to the conclusion that it was spirit voices they heard. This opinion became so common that no one dared enter the wood. Endless fabulous adventures were recounted, and in the general terror consisted Blue Bird's safety. Never a day passed but he made some present to Florine, a pearl necklace or rings with the most brilliant jewels and of the finest workmanship, clusters of diamonds, bodkins, bouquets of precious stones to imitate the colors of flowers, delightful books, medals in short, an endless number of rare wonders. She never decked herself except in the night time to please the king, and during the day, having nowhere else to put her fine things, she hid them carefully in her mattress. Two years passed away like this, and Florine never once uttered a complaint about her imprisonment. And why should she have done so? Every night she had the satisfaction of speaking to her love, and never were such pretty things said as during these conversations. Although she saw no one, and Blue Bird passed the day in the hollow of a tree, they had always a thousand fresh things to say to each other. Their material was inexhaustible, for in their own hearts and minds they found abundant subjects of conversation. Meanwhile the wicked queen, who kept her in this cruel fashion in prison, was making vain efforts to get Triton married. She sent ambassadors to offer her to all the princes whose names she knew, 
but as soon as they arrived they were sent away without ceremony. If you had come about Princess Florine, we should have welcomed you gladly, they were told. But for Truton, she may remain a vestal forever for all anybody cares. Hearing this, Truton and her mother were beside themselves with anger against the innocent princess whom they persecuted. What, they said. In spite of her being in prison, this bold hussy comes in our way. How can we ever forgive the evil turns she has done us? She must keep up a secret correspondence with foreign countries. She is a state criminal, and must be dealt with as such. Let us seek her conviction. Their consultation lasted so long that it was nearly midnight when they decided to mount the tower to question the princess. Florine was with Blue Bird at the window, decked in all her jewels, her beautiful hair dressed with a care which is not usual with anyone in distress. Her room and her bed were heaped with flowers, and the Spanish pastilles which she had been burning gave out a delicious scent. Listening at the door, the queen thought she heard a two-part song being sung. Florine had a voice like an angel's, and what she now sang sounded to the queen like a love song. Here are the words of it. Weary our lot and full of woe. And all our days in pain are spent. Oh! Hard and cruel punishment. Because our love we'd not forego. Yet may they plot and plague us ever. Our constant hearts they cannot sever. What sighs followed their little concert? Ah, my Truton, we are betrayed, cried the queen, suddenly throwing the door open and bursting into the room. At sight of her, Florine was in despair. She closed the little window without delay to give time to Blue Bird to fly off, much more anxious about his safety than her own. But he had not the strength to go. His keen eyes had recognized the danger to which the princess was exposed. He had seen the queen and Truton, and he deplored the sad fate that hindered him from protecting his mistress. They approached her like furies ready to devour her. Your plots against the state are known, cried the queen. Do not imagine that your rank will save you from the punishment you deserve. And with whom have I plotted? Madam, answered the princess. You have been my jailer for two years, have you not? Have I seen any persons but those you have sent to me? While she was speaking the queen and her daughter were examining her with the utmost wonder, for her marvelous beauty and her wonderful apparel dazzled them. And whence, madam, come these jewels that shine brighter than the sun, said the queen. Will you have us believe that there are mines of them in this tower? I found them here, replied Florine, that is all I know. The queen looked at her searchingly to see what was passing in Florine's secret heart. We are not your dupes, she said. You think you can deceive us, but, princess, we know all you do from morning till night. You have been given all these jewels as a bribe to you to sell your father's kingdom. Of course I should be the very person to do such a thing, she replied, with a disdainful smile. An unhappy princess, who has languished in prison for years, can do a great deal in a plot of that kind. And for whom then have you decked your hair like a little coquette? For whom does the pastille scent your room, and for whom have you put on such gay apparel, more magnificent than if you had been to appear at the court? I have time enough on my hands, said the princess. It is, therefore, not strange that I spend a few moments on my own adornment. I need hardly reproach myself on account of that, seeing I have to spend so many in weeping for my unhappy lot. Ha! Huh. But we shall see if this innocent damsel has not all the same made a treaty with our enemies. Thereupon she set to searching all round, and coming to the bed, which she had shaken out, she found in it such a quantity of diamonds, pearls, rubies, emeralds, topazes, that she could not think where they had come from. She had determined to hide somewhere papers of such a nature as would ruin the princess. When no one was looking she hid them in the chimney, 
but by good luck Blue Bird was perched on the top of it, and seeing better than a lynx, and hearing all, he cried, Take care, Florine, your enemy is seeking to betray you. This voice, so unexpected, frightened the queen to such a degree that she did not dare to do what she had intended. You see, madam, said the princess, that the spirits of the air are my friends. I believe, answered the queen, beside herself with anger, that you have the demons on your side, but in spite of them your father will know how to right himself. Heaven grant, cried Florine, that I may never have worse to fear than my father's wrath. Yours, madam, is more terrible. The queen left her in great trouble at all she had seen and heard, and took counsel as to what she should do to defeat the princess. They told her that if some fairy or some enchanter had taken her under their protection, it would only irritate them to torment her further, and it would be best to try to discover her secret. 